Now, verse 16. This is actually quite sad. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. In the Roman judicial system, you had what was called, what we would call today, a preliminary hearing, where the charges are brought against you. At this preliminary hearing, you could have witnesses come and speak on your behalf. So Paul is standing there in, in, in the docket, and they're making these accusations against him. And he could have had a number of people come and say, ah, yes, I know the Apostle Paul, and the charge that you have against him is simply not true. Here's his character, here's his life, here's what he has done. And Paul says, at my first defense, no one came to stand. How that must have hurt. It is the age of Nero. It is an age in which persecution is on the increase. Nero had blamed the burning of Rome on the Christians. He was the one who was arresting them. It was disgusting what Nero was doing to these Christians. He would fillet them, skin them. One historian says that he would take Christians and he would impale them on poles and then light them on fire to be human torches for his Colosseum. It was awful. And the fear that spread through the Christian community, we can't even imagine. And in the face of those trials and that persecution, he said nobody was willing to face my accusers with me. But I love his heart when he says, may it not be charged against them. As soon as I read those words, I thought of what Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's as if Paul is saying, Lord, I understand their fear. I've experienced those fears myself. Don't, don't hold this against them. They love you. They are dedicated to you, but please don't. The thing that really gives me courage and hope is what verse 17 says, But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Th those words that begin verse 17, The Lord stood by me and strengthened me. Nobody else was there, just the Lord. He stands with me. I didn't have you, Timothy. I didn't have any of the others who, who tried to follow me, but I had the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Timothy, as I stood there, he strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear. I'm imagining this scene. I don't know if this is exactly how it was. I don't know what the Roman court of law was like, but in my imagination, this is what I see. I see a large hall. The floors are marble. There are marble pillars lining the sides. There's a very high ceiling. And Paul stands there in this docket. And there is some speculation that Nero himself presided over this hearing. So here's Paul standing there, probably chained, maybe with his hands behind his back or shackled. And instead of having tears and feeling like this, he says, the Lord was with me, he stood by me, he strengthened me, and Paul shared the gospel. The, the, the irony of this situation, I just love it. Paul is the captive, allegedly. But he realizes that the real captives are the audience in that room. That Paul is the most free person in that hall that day. And I can hear Paul, this short, little, unattractive man, chained as he was to whomever he was, rising up, lifting up his voice and saying, may I tell you why I'm here? You have accused me of this, but let me tell you about my Jesus. Jesus, born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, lived his life sinless, and he tells the whole story of Jesus Christ. And he said he was crucified, and he died for the sins of the world. And they put him in a tomb, and three days later, he can you imagine all of the people in the hall who had come to see this famous evangelist you know, be, be sentenced to death, and they hear the gospel message. The last opportunity Paul had in the public view, he's sharing the gospel of Christ all the way to the end. I've probably told you 50 times in the course of First and Second Timothy 
For Paul, it is always about the gospel. It's always about the gospel. If they take my life, it's always about the gospel. If they take your life, uh, God be with you and strengthen you, but it's always about the gospel. Be focused on that. I just love the opportunity that God has given Paul here. And he closes the end of this section by saying, to him be glory forever and ever, amen. This is not a man who is wimping out on his last breath in life. This is not a man who's leaving life, we say, with his tail between his legs. This is a man who is triumphant. He is victorious. He is praising God till his last breath on this earth. He has some final greetings that are almost like a, an additional at the end. He says in verse 19, Greet Prisca and Aquila, close friends of his. The household of Onesephorus, Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus. But here's the second bookend. I told you there was one. In verse 9, he said, Do your best to come to me soon. Here's bookend number two. Do your best to come before winter. Timothy, would you please come? Timothy, is there any chance you could get here before winter? Is there any chance? If you get this letter and you have a chance to come as quickly as possible, would you come? As near as I could tell by drawing around on a map, it was about 900 miles. The journey would be very long. But would you come? I know you'll come. If you have time and opportunity, somebody will take your place. Will you come? Eubulus sends greetings to you, Hudens, Linus, Claudia, the brothers. And he concludes very simply saying, The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. And that's it. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. And I imagine Paul taking his quill. And he writes that last word, Grace be with you. I imagine him taking that writing utensil, laying it down, probably blowing on those words, the ink is still wet. I imagine him sitting back with a, a sense of satisfaction. And, oh, I finished. I don't imagine him being discontent. I imagine him having a sense of peace and of joy. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be to you. Winter is almost over. For Paul, that winter was going to come in the next short period of time. If, if tradition is to be believed, and, and that's all we have to go on, he was lifted out of that prison. He was led outside of the city. They had him kneel down. They took a sword or an axe, and they chopped his head off. For Paul, that was the best day of his life. For me to live as Christ, to die as King, the best day of his life. That the Jesus Christ that he met on that Damascus road, he now met face to face for the first time. I never knew you when you were human on earth, but boy, what a joy to see you now. If you're experiencing a winter of your life, don't give up. Don't lose hope. I come back to some words that Chuck Swindoll wrote in that same book when he was talking about winter. This is where he left off when I, I left off the reading. He says this, And then, at long last, winter's end. The promise returns. New hope. Reshaped values. Deeper commitment. A patch of blue sky breaks through my dungeon window. The snow has begun to melt. Finally, in grace, God's other hand pulls back winter's drape. The sun, that long-awaited source of light, shines again. Remember when he had said winter comes and the drape, the curtain, comes closed and we can't see the light. Shortly after writing 2 Timothy, the drapes were flung open and Paul saw the light. Again. Friend, I I'm not sure where you are right now classmates here in this class, wherever you're hearing these words, you can have hope again. You might be going through a season of winter and you say, I don't know if I can hang on. Your church may be divided. Your church may be in chaos. 
your home or your marriage may be in difficult circumstances, the Apostle Paul is giving you hope. The gospel of Jesus Christ motivates us to do everything. The strength of Jesus Christ gives us the power to do what God has called us to do. In your churches, in your home, in your personal life, seek Him, pursue Him. That's the journey of my life. When I came here to Russia, I was in a very discouraged frame of mind. I was burned out. I was weary. I told my leaders, man, I need a break. There's too much pressure on me. I have too many things to do. I think it's a, a crazy idea to come to Russia and teach. I don't have much time to prepare. But brothers, would you give me permission to go? Because every time God allows me to go to Russia, it fills my soul. I think of the words that, that Jesus quoted. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And I told my leaders, I said, I feel like I'm serving the Lord with my mind and with my strength, but not my heart and my soul. I remember the first time that I thought about coming to Russia. It was 1999 or 2000. And the director of, of arranging for pastors to come here and teach was in charge of finding teachers. And I wrote him and I said, I'm interested in this. Tell me about it. But I'm just a pastor. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a particularly intelligent person. Why should I do this? And he said, here's what he told me. I've never forgotten. He said, you know, in Russia, and this is now 10 years ago, he said, we need the theological and biblical expertise that American pastors have. But he said, you know what American pastors need? They need the passions that they see in the believers in Russia. They need the passion that the believers have in Russia. And I said, I'll go. And you know what I found out? That that's true. Honestly, I don't know if any of you need what I've had to teach. But every time I go home, my body is fatigued, but my soul and my spirit are full. That the chance to share God's word with you is one of the greatest privileges of my life. Am I the best? No. <laughs> I'm just a simple farmer from North Dakota who God called to be a pastor, who loves God's word and who makes mistakes almost every day, who does not lead perfectly, but is trying to learn to love the Lord my God with all my heart and all my soul in addition to my mind. That'd be my prayer for you. That you can learn about God in so many different ways. That your churches, you know what, God may not give you everything you want in your life or in your church or in your family. But if you seek him, he will be found. He will give you strength. He will give you courage to do more than you can ask or imagine. I want to leave you with my favorite prayer of the Apostle Paul. That if I could write a prayer, this is, this is what I would have prayed. Only Paul says it better than I can. It's in his book of Ephesians. And he says this. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. This is my concluding prayer for you. Imagine me saying it to you instead of the Apostle Paul to the, the believers in Ephesus. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And then he concludes this way. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him be glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations. Amen. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. 
For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.